science, reason, logic, science, reason, science, reason, logic, science. Try a little science, reason, logic, science, reason, apply a little science. We start the evening with Professor A.C. Grayling, who is going to, I think you're going to do a, a shortened version of your proof of atheism talk. Is that right? Great. Okay, I'll hand you over. Professor A.C. Grayling. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Good. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, yes. You very often hear from people who have a theistic view of things that you cannot prove that there is no deity. Or well, I always like to say that you can't prove that there are no gods and goddesses, just to get the conversation shaped in the right way. Uh, and in fact, you can. And in order to, to see how you can, I'm going to demonstrate to you how you can, uh, you need to think a little bit about the concept of proof itself and associated concepts. Now, those of you who have studied some philosophy, and indeed some of you who don't like philosophy, like my friends Lawrence and Richard up there, <laughs> you may uh, remember from your studies that the definition of knowledge, the strict definition of knowledge, is so strict that outside a formal context, outside mathematics or formal logic, nothing counts as knowledge. Because all our claims to how things are in the world, uh, all our empirical claims, at any rate, are defeasible. That is, they could turn out to be wrong. And it is of the very nature of scientific investigation that we should be open to the possibility that we've got things wrong. And what we claim and what we advance in the way of uh, hypotheses and the tested versions of them, theories, uh, is that they are proportional to and strongly supported by the evidence that we have for them. So given that that is the case, we need to look at a couple of things associated with this idea of how you prove things. Well, in the case of mathematics and of logic, a proof is always deductive. And if you look at a, an instance of deductive reasoning, you note something rather interesting, which is that the conclusion of a deduction is always already implicit in the premises. All There's an example which shows you that in a deduction, what you're doing is rearranging the terms of the premises to yield your conclusion. Now, it often happens in the case of deductions. I mean, if you're a fan of Hercule uh, Poirot and all the evidence and all the murder victims and all the suspects up on the board and looks at them very carefully, just trying to see how the answer is going to pop out from the information which is already there. Well, that's very characteristic of what a deduction is. So there is never any logical novelty in the conclusion of a deduction, even if there can be psychological novelty. And my favorite story to illustrate that is the story of the, of the Duke. So you see he's a French Duke uh, having a weekend party at his chateau on the Loire. And the guest of honor is a famous cardinal. And uh, at one point in the evening, the Duke has to go downstairs to get some more Chateau Neuf du Pape for his guests. And while he's absent, the cardinal regales the assembled company with a story, which is that when he was a very young, newly ordained curé, the first person who came to have confession with him was a very vile, multiple murderer. Whereupon the Duke reappears, 
claps the cardinal on the shoulder, says, you know, I've known the cardinal for an awfully long time. I was the very first person to have confession. And of course, then all the guests leave. Well, there's an example of psychological novelty, even though as a deduction, there's no logical novelty in the conclusion. So that's what happens in a formal context. Proof is deductive proof in a formal context. But in the empirical context, in thinking about the world around us, proof has a different and, in a way, a more important meaning. And you can see this from looking at um, the sorts of things we say as when we say the proof of the pudding is in the eating, meaning the test of the pudding is in the eating. Or when you go to a steel foundry and you see that every hundredth rod or sheet uh, um, cast in, in the foundry is taken aside and is uh, tested. They take the rod, for example, and they load it to see how much loading it will bear before it fractures. And this is known as proving the steel, testing the steel. You know, we say uh, the exception that proves the rule. Well, most people think that if there is an exception, then the rule's okay. But of course, it doesn't mean that. It means that the exception tests the limits of application of the rule. So proof in the empirical case means test. And you can prove that claims to the effect that there are supernatural agencies in the universe can be tested to destruction in this way, uh, testing to see whether they stand up to scrutiny. Now, one very, very straightforward example of this, of course, is the famous uh, dragon in the garage example. You remember that from Carl Sagan. You know, somebody says to you, I've got a dragon in my garage. You say, ooh, wonderful. I'd love to see a dragon. Uh, well, this one's invisible. So you say, oh, well, okay. But we can hear it flapping its leathery wings, can't we? No, this one is silent. Ah, oh, right. Well, we can feel its hot breath, can't we? No, this one doesn't have one. Then you say, well, let's put talcum powder on the floor and see if we can see its footprints. No, this one never lands on the floor. And so it goes on. And so you have tested the claim that there is a dragon in the garage. And if nothing whatever counts as uh, establishing that there is a dragon in the garage, then there isn't one. The claim is empty. The claim is not supported by any relevant evidence. And this picks up on a point that uh, Karl Popper made, a very, very good and a very important point, which is that if some claim uh, doesn't tell you what would count against the claim, if it doesn't identify you with the counter evidence so that you know how to test that claim, then the claim is empty because the claim is consistent with everything. And one thing that you will know, of course, is that uh, when you talk to people who have a theistic commitment of one kind or another, that no contrary evidence that you offer them, nothing to do with the existence of natural moral even in the world, nothing to do with logical impossibilities like whether or not God can eat himself for breakfast and so on, none of these sorts of claims will ever count against the, the conviction that there is uh, such a being for somebody who has such a conviction. And that means, therefore, that the claim to the effect that there is such a being is an empty claim. So that is one very powerful way or set of ways of uh, uh, showing that you can prove, that is, you can test claims to the effect that the universe contains one or more uh, supernatural transcendent entities in some way uh, in the uh, spatio-temporal domain or outside it or any way interested in it, wanting to know what you can eat on Fridays and what you must and mustn't wear and who you can marry and so on. So all, all those claims can be tested by the means I've just described. But there are other means too. There is the uh, a point, uh, the more general point, about the um, rationality which is implicated in what I've just been saying. Because what I've just been saying suggests to you that if in the empirical case, in thinking about the world, we can never say about anything, whatever, I know with 100% certainty unless you can provide a deduction of the formal kind, then what you have said is, as I remarked, defeasible. That is, you have to be open to the possibility that there's some evidence that might press against the view that you're taking, such that you have to adjust your view or come up with better evidence. And it is of the, the very essence, to repeat the point, that science is open to that. Science is always ready uh, to look at contrary evidence and to um, think about how to accommodate that evidence or to revise theories or to look for a new theory 
if the uh, uh, contrary evidence is very powerful. So what is it that uh, somebody will claim if they uh, put forward a, a view, a powerfully tested, a powerfully um, evidenced view, if the claim in question is still to be regarded as defeasible? Well, what it is they will be saying is that it is rational to believe this, where rationality is a very, very important aspect of the claim. Look at the word rational. The first part of that word is ratio. Ratio means proportion. So if the evidence that you have for a belief or a commitment or a decision to act a certain way is genuinely proportional to the evidence that you have in its favor, then it is a rational belief. This is why it is not rational to believe that there are fairies at the bottom of your garden, because the evidence in favor of that hypothesis is so weak and the evidence against it is so powerful that it is irrational to believe it. Again, take as an example of, of what a, a rational belief um, looks like. Supposing, for example, you have been reading uh, you know, some um, logic textbook, and the logic textbook tells you that inductive inferences, those which are based on enumerating instances of some sample and then drawing a general conclusion from it, you know, this one is white, that one is white, that, so all swans are white, that kind of induction by simple enumeration in that case. There are other forms, but they all share the same characteristic, which is that the conclusion of an inductive inference is always goes beyond the evidence that you have for it. So you can never regard an induction as absolutely settling how things are. So you look out of the window and you see it's bucketing down with rain. And you say to yourself, well, every time I've been in the rain without an umbrella in the past, I've got wet, but that's just an inductive inference. So maybe this time I can go out in the rain without an umbrella and maybe I won't get wet. Well, what will the neighbors think when they see you sallying forth without an umbrella? They think you're an idiot. Why? Because you haven't proportioned your action, your belief, your commitment to the evidence that you have for it. And that is the mark of a rational belief, that it is genuinely proportional to the evidence. And this, of course, is where the whole burden, the whole weight of thinking about looking for um, evidence, testing claims, testing the claims to destruction, really uh, trying to infirm some view that you have, uh, that is where the whole idea of having a, a rational belief uh, uh, comes down. So now, to think in terms of the rationality of our outlook, we can do very, very much more than what I've already said. So, for example, we can ask ourselves questions like, well, just how plausible, given our general understanding of the world, how things work and how we uh, find ourselves having to behave in the world, I mean, you know, for example, finding it a bit difficult to walk through brick walls and you know, finding it advisable not to just stand in the middle of the street in the path of an oncoming bus and so on. So just very, very general beliefs about how the world works. And we can ask ourselves general questions about the plausibility of claims to the effect that there are transcendent beings or supernatural agencies in the world. And we can do this in a number of different ways. One of the most interesting and uh, powerful is to look at the way beliefs to the effect that there are such entities in the universe have worked in the course of history. So you look right back across the landscape of time and you see that our very earliest ancestors had very little in the way of uh, resource for explaining natural phenomena other than their own felt capacity as agents. I can pick up a stone and throw it into a into a lake and it makes a splash. So I did that, I was the you know, major part of the causal chain of events there that brought about the splash. So the thunder, the lightning, the um, movement of the trees in the wind, that can only be explained on that basis by the activity of some agency, a god or gods or, or beings of some kind, supernatural beings. And indeed, if you look at the mythologies of the world, and the one that we're most familiar with is Greek mythology, you see that uh, every tree uh, has its dryad, every stream its nymph, that all the powers of nature are associated with agencies, Poseidon, uh, you know, causing earthquakes, and Zeus uh, throwing the thunderbolt. And therefore, in, in a way, you can think of the very early origins of religion, the mythologies, as being a kind of proto-science, because it's an attempt to provide an explanatory framework of some kind.
And you can even see um, the uh, attempt by people to interact with these agencies or to influence their behavior by prayer or ritual or, or sacrifice. You can see that as a kind of proto-technology, as a way of relating to these agencies and these powers in the world. I would have thought, by the way, that uh, in the very, very early experience of our remotest ancestors, very probably, um, the experience of, of uh, dreams or, or uh, hallucinations in fevered states or mistakenly eating a, an Amanita muscaria mushroom and having a, you know, uh, um, an interesting kind of weekend experience, or um, maybe some of the food that you'd stored fermenting and then you eat it or drink it, get drunk, that those experiences were interpreted as penetrating the barrier between the mundane world and the spiritual world. And I'm pretty sure that there was some bloke at some point in history who thought, oh, well, if I could persuade the rest of the tribe that I could communicate with these agencies, then I'm going to get all the money and all the girls. And that's really how organized religion took off. But you can see, if you, if you think in terms of, of, of how, how you could do a kind of genealogy of the way that beliefs and then uh, even religious institutions would have arisen, arisen out of the need to explain and to relate to phenomena, but on the basis of very limited resources to do it. Then, of course, it becomes institutionalized, and there's no question but that uh, organized religion as a sociological, historical phenomenon have, has been extremely useful to, um, the, to powers, to people who rule, kings and emperors, or even indeed to the clerics themselves, um, actually exerting the power in society. Because this is a marvelous way to organize uh, people, to corral them, to, to organize their energies even, but to police them also. Because after all, what could be more effective than to tell people that there is an invisible policeman who knows absolutely everything you do and even think, even when you're on your own in the dark? This is a very, very powerful way of doing things. And then if you can persuade them that all their feelings of anxiety and weakness will be uh, assuaged if they come and tell you their secrets in the confessional, how much more useful that is to you too. So you can see this is a really uh, extraordinary tool uh, in a way for social control and management of society. There, uh, you, you have uh, one indication of how you might try to look uh, again across this great uh, panoply of, of um, ways in which uh, religions, religions as institutions, religious beliefs by individuals and groups, um, have been uh, rooted in the early experience of needing explanation, of needing a way of uh, relating to the world, and how when institutionalized, they became so very pervasive and so very important to uh, uh, structures of power in society. And if you ask yourself uh, um, why it is that, uh, that uh, religious belief persists, why is it that there are still churches? Why are there still uh, religious movements in the world? One thing you notice is that religions have two great resources that they draw upon. One is the indoctrination of children. If nobody heard about uh, religion or gods or angels or beliefs of that kind until they had reached the age of intellectual maturity, they would find it very difficult to take any of these things seriously. And uh, the second, of course, is the fact that uh, there is a kind of trajectory in human affairs. You know, when you're young, it might be that you go to Sunday school, occasionally you go with your parents to church. I mean, most people in this country are C of E, aren't they, sort of Christmas and Easter. So you do that, and something lingers there. And then on important occasions in society, there are men in, in you know, long dresses who perform um, coronations and uh, other great celebrations. When you get to courting age, you know, teenage and early adulthood and so on, religion is a terrible nuisance because, you know, you want to sin. So you tend to be very secular at that age. And then, you know, you get to middle age, and what happens? Your parents die, you lose your job, you get divorced, you feel absolutely miserable, so you end up going to your local church. And what happens when you go to your local church is you meet some very nice people. They're very welcoming, give you cups of tea, make new friends, and you associate that with 
the faith and not with the social support that you're getting from the group. And usually what tends to happen after a bit is that as you sit and listen to all that stuff about walking on water and raising from the dead and the rest of it, you think, oh, God, really? And then you drift away from that into what I call the feng shui tendency and buy yourself a crystal instead. So there is a sort of a, a trajectory there which explains how capturing minds, uh, and the, the minds of children, infusing those minds with these uh, beliefs and attitudes, allowing them to d appear to dissipate at certain points in life, but feeling that you could always reel them in again later on when there are uh, troubles or disasters. Or when you get to be very old and you start, as they say, swatting for finals, you might want to you know, go back, um, <laughs> back to those beliefs then. But that is how the religions keep a hold. They have attraction on the human mind. And indeed, um, psychological studies suggest that uh, for good evolutionary reasons, when you're walking through a park at night and you hear a rustle in the bushes, it's better to wonder whether that might be a, you know, a, a predator animal about to leap on you and eat you than just to think it's, it's the breeze and not take any notice of it. And so to think that there is agency in the world, uh, to imagine that there might be you know, beings or, or a being uh, who watches you or has some influence over your fate or your destiny. That is not an unnatural thing for people to think for perfectly good non-religious um, uh, uh, reasons. Uh, it may very often be uh, untrue that there is a, a lion lurking in the bush. It's extremely unlikely in Hyde Park, but you, you, nevertheless, the anxiety that it might be there fleetingly would be something that survives from your evolutionary past. And it's that also which helps to feed into credulity and acceptance by a lot of people who are very unreflective, the kind of people Daniel Kahneman called as fast thinkers, you know, the ones who just take the first thing they see uh, on the internet or the first thing they hear of a conspiracy theory and then want to believe it because it provides a simple explanation. And I often say to people, you know, you can explain the chief dogmas of any of the major religions, indeed any religion in the world, in less than half an hour. And it takes a bit more than that to know some physics, or even for that matter, some philosophy. But there you go. So next time you, you meet somebody who is a convinced theist of some kind, you have a whole menu of opportunities there to say, well, um, let's test the claims that you believe your faith commitment consists in, let's see if they stand up to scrutiny, either on the logical basis that I explained, or by putting them in the context of, of human history and the, and the uh, history of religions and what they do and have done in the world. And one final point. It is, of course, true that um, many people have been moved by their faith, and many people uh, in many religious organizations have committed themselves to works of charity, have been the inspiration for beautiful music and, and wonderful art. Um, that is true. But great works of charity, beautiful music and beautiful art, have been produced by people who aren't religious as well. So it is not uh, a kind of guarantee that only the best of the and richest of the aesthetic experiences available to us in our life uh, comes from people with religious motivation. But what the religions have been very good at is they have taken those aspects of our response to the world. You know how it is when you stand on a hilltop and you see a sunset over the sea, or you are moved by a, a, a very beautiful song, as it might be, or a beautiful face, and you feel that sense of connection with things beyond yourself. If you have been given a religious upbringing, and if you don't have the resources to interpret that kind of experience other than by thinking that it is some contact with the numinous. You know how many people say, well, of course, I don't believe in God, but there is something out there, you know, that kind of idea. And some sense, because you only notice coincidences that are really, I mean, a million of them happen to you every day, but you only notice those that are particularly salient to you. Or think that there is some direction in your life that you hadn't been aware of or, or, or planned. That, that natural propensity to try to attribute it to something outside oneself that is something that the religions have made much of. They've, they've kind of sequestered that and told us that our, what they call the spiritual aspect of our experience belongs to them and belongs to religion. And it doesn't. It's a fact about us. 
David Hume, the philosopher, said, you know, we, we say all the bad things that happen in the world, and there are plenty of them, God knows, <laughs> but, the, but all the good things come from, you know, outside ourselves. And yet we are the creatures capable of responding to beauty and to affection, uh, to friendship. We are uh, creatures capable of doing things, great generosity and kindness, tenderness. Uh, we are uh, people attuned to uh, beauty. We don't need to reach out to some external, uh, adventitious, outside influence for us to see ourselves as uh, creatures of that kind. We should own um, that kind of experience. And if we can use the word spiritual to mean our own spirit, our own emotions and intellectual responses to things, and not attribute it to something outside ourselves. And once we do that, I think, we begin to see that, in fact, um, the uh, claim that the religions make to be the owners of spiritual experience and the arbiters of morality is simply don't stand up to scrutiny. So there we go. There, there, there are some ways of thinking about these matters, and uh, you will be able to demolish anybody you next meet in the pub who says you can't prove that there isn't a God, because you can. Thank you. We haven't got time, yeah. I'm afraid. No, sorry. Well, and AC is... Atheism UK's prof uh, honorary president. Yeah. Get it out. Get it. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Mm. Uh, okay, thank you.